to develop those skills and the strategies that they need and the strategies that we as teachers can provide to help them, to support them in um, skills development. I do beg your pardon, let me just go into presentation mode so that everything's clearer for you. Okie dokie, okie dokie. So looking at the context, looking at the environment within which we teach these skills and we support our students in learning these skills. There are some key points here that I want to mention, even though I know they will be familiar to you. Uh, I want to mention them just to reiterate them, to emphasize them, because this is the context within which we teach. And if these things aren't present, that will impact on the quality of our teaching and the success of our student skill development, basically. So five points here that I'm just going to mention briefly. The environment within which we teach. And by that, I mean the, the feeling that the students have when they're learning, the atmosphere, the surroundings, the kind of general tone of the learning environment. And that needs to be, as you will know, not only supportive for the students, but also conducive for our students to learn. They need to feel that they're in a good place and they need to feel safe. And when I say safe, our students need to feel safe to make mistakes because that's part of the learning process. So that environment where there's no need for embarrassment or shyness, where they will feel comfortable making mistakes because it's an accepted part of learning. That is the most conducive environment for us to create for our students. Similarly, the relationship that we set up with our students is key, absolutely key. I mean, if you think back to your own schooling, your own education, you will probably think of the teachers who were most important to you, who had the most impact on your own learning. And those will be the teachers with whom you had the best relationship for one reason or another. You trusted them, they listened to you, they understood you, they, they clearly supported you. So that relationship building is important um, throughout the educational journey for our students. Monitoring is also key because it gives us feedback about how well our students are doing and any problem areas they might have and it also gives them feedback about how well they're doing and how successfully they're starting their journey towards developing certain skills. When I say collaboration I, I really mean that the teacher-student relationship is a partnership and both sides are important and the input from both sides is also important and students need to know that it is a collaborative situation where their views and their input is also relevant and important and the final thing about tailoring is really a nod towards the fact that our, our students learn in so many different ways and sometimes we have to tailor the delivery of our lessons to account for that diversity in learning styles. Um, so if we just move on to look briefly at some of the ways in which our students learn, the three key areas, if you want to divide it into three areas, are visual, <coughs> auditory, and kinesthetic. And you can see here the points that are mentioned in respect of each of those three areas, learning styles. Don't think for a minute but if, if our students, some of our students learn best in an auditory environment, don't think that that means that they're really good at listening and speaking skills because it doesn't. It simply means that they learn various information better in those sorts of auditory scenarios. But it doesn't mean that they'll necessarily be better at learning skill development than any of the other students because that's a different element. It's a different layer of learning, if you like. But that attention to our students' learning styles is something that you will see um, accounted for in all, in all the course books. And that's why there is that diversity of approaching course books so that there's variation and so that each of the different learning styles is given some attention and is taken into account in an overall teaching situation. 
So the last thing just to talk about briefly in this general contextual picture is that these are some of the strategies that our students studying English for academic purposes, that specific academic environment, these are some of the strategies that they need. And there are quite a few, and it's a big change if they've come into this environment from a general English course, which doesn't look in as much detail at these strategies. So they need to be able to plan, and they need to have their own strategies for that and take responsibilities themselves for that. They also need strategies for understanding new language, new situations, new listening contexts and so forth. They need to develop strategies for doing that. How can they support their own understanding? They need active language strategies for remembering and appropriately applying the language that they're learning. They need strategies to summarize so that they can reflect, review and reflect on their own learning. They need to be able to question constantly question, so strategies for that. Strategies, as we mentioned before, for collaboration, so they can work together with fellow students and they can also work with their instructors to get the best out of every situation. And visualization strategies where they might be able to put the information into a different format that better helps them understand what they're learning. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff there around just the context of the learning situation, but that's the reality. There are many factors that come into play in an educational setting. So let's focus in now on the listening and speaking skills, because this is what we're primarily wanting to talk about today. So um, I put this here so that you can understand, we, we are told that about 70% of adults, uh, sorry, adults spend, spend about 70% of their time communicating. Of that time spent communicating, almost half involves listening. Almost half of that time in communication is spent listening. And that's a huge proportion when you look at the other skills. Speaking also, 30%. So when we looked at reading and writing and the importance of those skills last week, we were just looking at 25%, basically, if that's the right, yes, it is, 25% of communication time. Listening is massively important. Okay, so I just want to reiterate that because we sometimes listening isn't fully understood uh, and it's not given quite the importance that it absolutely needs to have in an, in an English learning situation. To be very clear about listening, it's important that we remember it's not the same as hearing. It's entirely different. This is this first part of this uh, graphic with the ear, that's the hearing. That's the receiving of the information. But all these stages need to go on as well for listening of any kind, academic or otherwise, to be successful. So the process is that the information is received, it's heard, then there needs to be a cognitive process so that it's understood, it's remembered, it's evaluated, and then it can be fed back in whatever way, transposed into different situations, used to answer questions from the knowledge gained in these three steps or whatever. But it's a complex process, and it's a process at which each of these stages could potentially fail if the recipient hasn't been able to develop the correct learning skills. And it is, it is a series of skills. So I wanted to really emphasize that. So the sorts of things that our students, our EAP students who are, who are learning English specifically for academic purposes, the sorts of skills that they need are as follows. They need, for example, to be able to develop skills in predicting content from the context. So if they're listening to a lecture about a specific topic, they might start to think before they listen and predict some of the things they might hear. Or if they're listening to a debate, they might give some thought to what might be the arguments for and the arguments against. 
then they need to develop those skills so that they can think strategically and equip themselves with a little bit of information that might help when they finally start listening. Our students need to be able to expand vocabulary from different contexts. And as they, as they move into the academic world, they are going to encounter new contexts and plenty of new vocabulary. So they need to be able to deal with that. And that's harder sometimes when they're hearing it rather than looking at it as a written word. So they will be exposed to a number of listening scenarios of students, very many of which might be lectures, but there'll be um, other types of listening scenarios which our students need to be aware of in terms of the function and the types of scenarios, uh, the rationale behind them. So this is really largely about preparation and how they get ready before they listen. They need to also be able to apply general strategies for interpreting content words, for understanding the sequence or being prepared to listen for gist and so on and so forth. Uh, and ultimately, given thinking about the learning styles we looked at just a minute or two ago, our students need help in determining the specific listening strategies that work for them as individuals, given their differences in learning styles. And it, it's really up to us as teachers to try to help them in determining which strategies are best for them, presenting them with various listening strategies, presenting them with various ways of approaching listening tasks, and helping them to evaluate those and see which ones worked more or less successfully for them. Okay. So skills for listening, the sort of thing that we come to expect in our books and the sorts of uh, steps that we tend to use, speaking very generally, to present listening and to help our students develop their skills. We often start, we just mentioned prediction, we often start with predicting and guessing to get the students to think about the topic, to use their own prior knowledge to predict or to guess what they might hear, what the main messages might be, um, words that they might expect to hear, arguments that they might expect and so forth. That's part of the engagement with the, the listening that they're just about to hear. Okay, and we need to get them hooked in to that listening somehow, so starting to prepare for it, starting to get their right mindset to listen. In the same way as we do with reading, we often in English course books um, front load with vocabulary to give the students a little bit more support when they're going to listen to a talk or a lecture that contains a, predictably a lot of unknown vocabulary, words they haven't heard before. We'll teach them how to work out meaning from context as best we can, but also if we give them some of those words, then again, we're just helping that level of preparation. We're just helping them engage more readily with what they're about to hear. The same goes for keywords and expressions that may be a bit more technical, that may be only related to a specific subject, let's say. If we present our students with those, then we're equipping them and we're helping them again to be able to engage more easily with what they hear. We should also encourage the students to think of the audience and to think of purpose. So, but they are the audience, but thinking of the purpose behind what they're listening, very often in a lecture, it might be that the purpose is simply to convey knowledge, convey facts, present a piece of research, and that's fine, but it's better for the students to know that context and that rationale, because again, it makes it easier for them to understand how everything comes together in what they're about to listen to. Language-wise, we need our students to be able to listen for sequence, to look, for, look out or listen out for discourse markers and order. Now that's more difficult than it sounds. Um, we'll look in, in a few minutes at lectures because lectures are fraught with difficulties for our students. 
but in general terms, we want the students to know how to listen out for those elements that show sequence where it's applicable. And last but not least, by any means, we want our students to be able to reflect and consolidate. We want them to get into the habit, really, of reflecting on every bit of information they encounter academically, whether they encounter it in reading or in listening. And when I say reflect, this is part of them internalizing the information, understanding what they've listened to, and then reflecting on what it really means to them and how they can use that information, how influential it's likely to be for them. So always, always that process of reflection on the part of our students is really relevant because it, if you like, metaphorically, it ties the knot between the student and the content. As they reflect, they're personalizing it for them and they're seeing what it means to them and consolidating the information. So all in all, it's quite a tricky process in terms of what we as teachers need to bring to the table and what the expectations are upon our students. It's a fairly tall order. So what we're going to do is just look briefly at some examples of listening uh, lessons in books, in English course books, and see what the differences are between general English and academic English. <clears throat> so this is an example from a general English book called Elevate. This is level three, I think, or yes, three as far as I can remember. And what you'll see here, what you can expect in general English books is a mention of a listening skill, but not a massively detailed explanation of it, nor um, a huge amount of practice of it. So you can see at the top of this particular page, the listening strategy is listening for detail, which is something our students will be required to do frequently as they listen to lectures and so forth. So there's a little explanation there, but as I say, pointing out a skill rather than presenting it in granular terms and practicing it. <clears throat> But then you'll see the predictable before, during and after approach that we use so often in um, listening as we did in reading. So we're asking students to look at the picture and think about the picture and what it might be symbolizing before they listen. Then during the listening, there'll be a task for students that where they're listening for specific details with a purpose, they need to fill in this table. So they know what they're listening for, it's all very clear. And it shouldn't be too difficult for them at this level of general English. And then after listening, they'll simply talk about a related subject, share some ideas with the partner, just take it a little bit further and personalise it for them. Same sort of thing, same sort of level of book, Elevate Again, where here <clears throat> the listening strategy is to contextualise. And one of the really important things about listening is the context of the vocabulary, because that will determine the level of the language, whether there are specialist words, whether there's technical vocabulary, and so on. So there's a little strategy here for uh, suggesting that students can try to figure out a word from the context, as they do, again, with reading, the other receptive skill. Then some engagement, where students are going to look at, uh, at these people and guess speculate about what they might be talking about. Um, then they're going to answer some uh, or complete some sentences and listen to check their answers. Okay, so that, that's the during listening. And then after listening, again, discussion of ideas relevant to what they've just heard, relevant to the general topic. So that's very much an approach in general English books. And that's the sort of thing that we see where there's an underpinning of some skill <clears throat> threaded into the content. But when we get to academic, English for academic purposes book, it's a lot more detailed. And it's clearly broken down into that three-step approach as it was with reading, where there's a before, a during and an after stage in the process. <clears throat> so here we can see that before the students listen, they are going to think about and discuss some questions. And again, that's the engagement with the topic, that's getting them to think about the subject area, and it's also equipping them with some of their own prior knowledge that might be in their minds 
that is going to help them to maybe engage with and understand what they're about to hear. Then there is this preloading, front loading of vocabulary that again will scaffold their understanding when they come to listen. Um, more thinking and predicting, but this time using imagery, which is more appropriate for some learners <clears throat> who learn well visually. So they're going to look at the images and the entrepreneurs and they can compare and make, um, they can make some notes, write the letter in the box for each photo, the people and what they're linked to, and then compare with partners or in groups and make changes if necessary. Then they move to the while you listen. And very often when they're listening to a lecture, this is going to be a requirement. We'll talk again in a minute about this, but they will very, very often be required to take notes, which sounds fairly simple. But again, for our students, um, at the level of starting their academic English journey can be fraught with difficulty. Okay, excuse me. So then looking at a detailed skill focus, which again is the sort of thing that you would expect to see in an English for Academic Purposes book, where there's a much more granular level of detail about the skills required and how to build those skills. So here there's something about outlining. And if students can develop this skill of outlining the lecture notes, then it's going to make it much easier for them when they come back to revisit their notes and they'll be able to remember more easily what we've talked about. So there's a big explanation of this here with a model, a sample outline, again, very useful. And then moving on to exercise six at the top of the next page, where they're going to apply that skill themselves. OK, and then as we saw in the general English books, the idea is they've listened, they've understood, they've applied some strategies. And now the students can speak from their own outline, using their own notes to talk about the subject matter. Okay, and it says here, do not look at any other notes or the audio script. <clears throat> so the students are simply relying on the notes that they've made. Okay, and that's, that's relevant because if they don't make their notes correctly, they're lost. They're onto a, a non-starter. So as I said, I want to talk a little bit more about lectures because it's, it's one of the most common uh, things, situations that students are going to have to listen to. And it's not, not simple for them, particularly if they're coming from a general educational setting, learning general English, where they are, where things are presented very incrementally in a very staged, paced kind of way with explanations and it all, it's all quite logical. That's not always the case for lectures. <clears throat> so a few things to say about lectures generally. They're not movies. Now I know that's obvious. They're not movies, we're just listening to a lecture. But lectures are, whereas movies are like a narrative and it's easy to follow the steps and the progression, lectures are hierarchical and they will start with various, they will start and then be scattered with various significant points that will lead to one or more conclusions at the end. But they're, they're often presented in a way that is more technical, it's more varied, it's more um, cellular almost, a point is made, and then there's some information and another point is made. It's the students who have to decide what's important. Because very often, when they're sitting listening to lectures, it won't be clear to them and it may not be made clear. What is actually important in this? What are the key words? Somebody delivering a lecture is not likely to stop and say, oh, make a note of this, write this down. This is an important word. They're, they're simply going to deliver the lecture and convey the information. So where students have to decide what information is important, they need a skill to do that. They need to learn and we need to teach them how they make those decisions, <clears throat> how they focus on key information. And similarly, with note taking, it's the same thing. They have to learn what they write down. 
And if they haven't learned that, they're not going to be able to understand their notes when they revisit them later. And the added difficulty with note taking is that while students are writing their notes, which they're doing simultaneously while they listen, they're, sh they're shifting attention. If they didn't make notes, all their attention could be given to what they're hearing, and they could try that processing uh, step, the processing step that we looked at earlier on, where they're internalizing and understanding the information. But they have this added difficulty of having to make notes as well. And they're guessing at what notes they should make. The key thing about this is that the, the best advice to give our students is they should note down what they think, not just random words that they hear, because in isolation, those won't mean anything and they won't support student understanding later. So what we're really needing students to do is to listen, to hear, to understand as best they can and write down what they think, their understanding. <clears throat> because without that, without that process, these notes are not going to be worth very much to them. And it's a key thing, the key thing that they need to learn and we need to help them with in terms of being discerning and deciding what that key information is, what that central point is that they should note down. Bear in mind as well, because we jumped across it, uh, across this point in the notes in front of us, students can't control the pace at which lectures are delivered. So it can become quite frenetic. It can become really tough, really hard for them to keep up, to listen, to hear, uh, to understand, to pick out what's key and to make those notes, it's, it's, it's quite difficult. Um, what they really must do in order for any of that to actually work is our students need to engage with the content. And that's, that relates to the students writing down what they think, not just those random words that they're, they're getting could be key words. And it, when they can do that, that's an indication of the fact they have engaged, they have mastered those techniques, those listening techniques that enable them to do a quick processing of what they're hearing and write down what they think it means in their words, those key points. But it's really, <clears throat> it sounds quite easy or listen and make notes, but it's actually such a complex process and we really need to support our students in doing that. So some of the strategies for us as teachers are these. Let's model good listening for our students so that they can see the process we're going through. And when I say it's quite hard to model listening, what I really mean by that is talking through it and explaining what the process of proper listening is. Um, maybe giving an example from listening to an extract and then suggesting some notes, but explaining to the students how you got to that stage, what you did, what your brain did, how you got from the hearing to the proper listening to the understanding. If we model that for our students, it's easier for them to understand. <clears throat> now, in terms of reflective listening, that is basically encouraging by, by demonstration, reflection on what's been heard. So that, like we talked before about reflection and students reflecting, encourage them to listen and then reflect, but encourage them initially to do that in a class situation where they feel safe to do so, where it's fine if they make mistakes and they don't get it right. Um, but encouraging that helps them as students to get to the stage where they're engaging with content they're hearing and they're processing it correctly. <clears throat> so then giving students a voice is basically um, checking in with them. It's basically how are they, how are they feeling about this? What are they struggling with? What's difficult? So that needs to happen in uh, listening lessons on an individual level and getting everyone's voice on a more general level. Because we as teachers need to know where those pain points are. We need to know what the stumbling blocks are. Uh, we need to be able to identify the difficulties so that we can help our students and give them those strategies and give them that modeling and give them those explanations 
so that they can actually work their way through those areas of difficulty. Sometimes we should talk less and they should talk less and the focus really should be on listening. But there is a point at which listening becomes overwhelming. And I read uh, quite recently that there's something, there's a random figure bandied about in some research that says students can listen, roughly speaking, for as many minutes as half their age. So if we think of our students, if we've got 18 year old students, the argument is they can listen effectively, attentively, constructively for nine minutes. So we can't go on and on and on giving them listening without breaking it up into chunks. And you can maybe build up from there once they've got the strategies to listen to shorter chunks, then you can try and increase the length. But it would be wrong of us as teachers to think that the best way is to immerse them in listening. And let's have a 20 minute listening or a 15 minute listening. But it's far too overwhelming initially with, until they've got their strategies for listening and processing worked out. When I say use cold calling, it, that is only really a strategy for us to avoid what sometimes happens in our lessons where specific students are always the ones who talk, answer the questions, give their opinions and so forth. So cold calling is where we encourage the less vocal, less confident students to join in by, by choosing them, by selecting them, whether it's randomly by picking names out of a hat or whether it's actually a conscious decision on our part as teachers that we'll choose so-and-so today because we really haven't heard from them for a while and we want to be sure that they're, you know, they're okay or if they're not okay, let's find out why and support them. So use cold calling. And overall, really, listen and learn from our students. Let's watch what they're doing, let's talk with them about how they're doing, let's find out what they're fe finding challenging, and let's take that on board for teachers. So we adjust our teaching styles, our presentation, our own strategies accordingly so that we can get everybody on board in the best possible way. Okay, so that's listening, let's just, that's the, receptive skill in the same way as reading was the receptive skill and writing was the productive one. Listening is a receptive skill and the partner, the productive partner to listening is of course speaking. So let's just move on to speaking, which if you remember was also a significant chunk of that communication time, second only to listening. And something that presents our students, I might say, with Again, a challenge because in listening, they are doing something so public. They are they're exposed. There's nowhere to hide. It's them, they're speaking, and they are using the language, the vocabulary that they've learned, but they're inside probably worrying that it's not appropriate that they're going to make a mistake. But it's, del it's a delicate scenario for them, and it's one that can be quite threatening and quite intimidating. So the four things to consider about speaking are the importance of speaking in any particular context, the context themselves, the opportunities that speaking can present and the issues that speaking brings with it. So in terms of the importance of speaking, you know, there are obvious reasons to speak in terms of communication. It's an interactive process which can help to develop students' understanding, develop their interpersonal skills and so on and so forth. And it is very often used in assessment in many of the key exams. There's going to be a whole part of the exam dedicated to speaking. So uh, if, if not for communication, simply for the purposes of passing exams, students need to master this skill. Many, many contexts um, for speaking situations, but in terms of academic situ situations, things like tutorials and seminars, as well as lectures are all very common. Students will get to the stage, if they're not there yet, where they are making presentations and that's hugely intimidating for them in the beginning. If they're presenting through a language they're not 100% confident about, it's really quite challenging. Question and answer sessions and one-to-one -one sessions and then classwork tasks where they may be speaking with groups or with pairs. 
the thing as well about speaking is to say that students can't hide in a pair. So if you're wanting to make sure that as far as possible, students all get a little bit of practice, pair work sometimes is preferable because you're more likely to have a more evenly balanced situation. And if there's a group of three or four, somebody can hide more easily, be reticent, be reluctant to talk more easily and get away with it. So then opportunities um, for students to learn about speaking, obviously, as with any of the skills, encourage the students to ask questions. When it says utilize resources, they really, this I would say is more about listening really. This is encouraging students to, to for example, listen to podcasts, uh, listen to television programs, listen to things on the radio where they're exposed to different accents and so forth, but also functionality, the functions within speaking that they're going to need to learn. Where they can, if they can observe native speakers, as maybe they could in television programs or films, that's also a plus. They can then see all the non-verbal stuff as well that we talk about in the next section, uh, and they can learn how that fits in with the spoken word. Repeating back is useful in listening and speaking. It's part of the reflection. It's part of the internalizing of information. But if um, students aren't sure, one of the good strategies for them to do is to repeat back what they think they've heard. So not only are they checking understanding, they are also using their own speaking skills as well. If they, listen, they hear something and they don't understand it, obviously we encourage them to ask for clarification before they speak and give their reply or their response. They need to be sure what they're talking about. And then the issue, a very significant issue for our students is that lack of confidence and their uncertainty about the language that they're using and uh, the timing of the interactions that they're making. Is it appropriate? Is it the, are they using the right language for that particular function? Um, and then we mentioned the nonverbal communication, the nonverbal information. Our students do need to decode that and some of that is culturally specific. So they need to learn that in the context of the English language. And most of our students, I would say, have a lack of presentation skills. In fact, a lot of people generally have a lack of presentation skills because it's not something they've had occasion to do. They haven't needed to do it. They haven't had much practice. <clears throat> so for our students, that's a really big part of helping them to develop their confidence and their language ability in terms of speaking. So put simply, these are the objectives that we want to support our students in developing with regard to speaking. They obviously need to develop their ability to produce utterances, sentences, phrases, and so on that are relevant to different speaking contexts and that um, carry out the correct function for what they're wanting to do, what they're wanting to convey. We need them to communicate clearly to achieve that function. And a lot of language that we teach them is functional language. It's for a particular context, for a particular purpose. And they need to have that range, that repertoire of different functional language so that they've got versatility and they're able to speak in different situations. They don't feel they're put on the spot. I'm so sorry. So um, they need to be communicatively competent in English, and that's about the development of their language competency, of their uh, grammar and their vocabulary, so that they can use it reasonably naturally without having to think too hard about what the next word might be or what they really want to say. Eventually, as they develop their speaking confidence, they'll be able to speak quite smoothly, uh, they'll be able to reply quite promptly because they're developing those speaking skills. So where it says here what and how to say things effectively, 
This is about not only responding appropriately, it's also about what happens in our natural speaking discourse, where we extend ideas, we change things, uh, we make suggestions, we hypothesize, and so on and so forth. So it's, it, this is a big ask for our students, but the more they develop their speaking skills, the more these things will develop alongside just the generic speaking skills. There's also that social element to speaking, where our students need to take turns, need to be polite, need to know what is and is not culturally appropriate in a speaking situation. So again, such a lot for them to learn. It's so it's a real, it's a challenge, and um, we have to be sure that we give them the knowledge that enables them to develop these skills because speaking is contextual and it is functional. Uh, it, can't, it can't be done in isolation and there has to be a purpose for it and there are particular steps. Um, so we'll look briefly just at some speaking pages in students' books, again, showing a general English book and what you would expect and then a more detailed academic English book to see what the steps are to develop some of these skills. <clears throat> a very common approach in general English is a speaking strategy up here, which you've just touched upon in the same way as it was in the listening uh, lesson. And then students listening to a model, listening to a conversation, which gives them the model for the dialogue. Then they'll have a go and they'll replay the conversation and they'll maybe include their own ideas. Okay. Then they may listen to something else, take notes, transpose that information. Because here it's hypothetical, a hypothetical situation, the speaking strategy, there's some more practice given to using appropriate language for hypothesizing. So it's quite structured, and very often it's that listening, feeding into writing that underpins speaking lessons uh, in, in the case of a, a general English book. Um, there's another one I think to show you. Yeah, exactly the same sort of format here, but this, the functionality here is complaints. And when there's a function like this, there will be specific language chunks that are relevant. And this is where we tend to present the phrases, the words and the phrases that our students can use in this scenario of complaining. They can't just say, I'm complaining. They have to be more polite about it. I mentioned being polite before. Um, they have to kind of apologize for complaining. That's a very British thing, I'm afraid, apologizing for being cross about something. Uh, and also how to respond to a complaint. And then there'll be the listening, then they'll take turns, and then they'll prepare for a role play. And incidentally, role plays are always a great way to practice speaking and um, tend to be quite a non-threatening and potentially fun way for our students to develop some of their speaking skills. So then we go back to an EAP, English for Academic Purposes, lesson on speaking. This one's taken from New Interaction. And here, there's some relevance to this because it's how to avoid plagiarism, which is a particularly important element in academic circles anyway. So there's a kind of dual purpose here students are going to be speaking, but they're also talking about something that's a relevant skill, a relevant consideration in academia. Um, so the way in, the lead in, is to discuss points with a partner and say whether these things are appropriate behavior or not, they're related to cheating. Then there is this equipping the students with uh, some of the vocabulary that they're going to hear. So this is all the before they speak, if you like. And then they listen to a college professor talking about plagiarism and they take notes. So again, this skill related to listening of taking the correct notes that will mean something when they look back at them in the future. And then because this is specifically an academic skill course, there's more detail here about dilemma and decision because these are considerations that students will need to address. And there's a role play scenario where they choose one or other of the situations to role play with a partner. <clears throat> and then, although this is a separate speaking lesson, I wanted to show you this too, because it relates to what we said about presentations and students making presentations. 
So very often in this particular book that <clears throat> there are research and prevent, present uh, lessons where the students are given a topic and they may brainstorm it, they make notes about it or whatever, but essentially they're going to research a topic and they're going to gather their findings from different countries in this case and make notes about them. There's a tip here because again, this is academic English, so they must cite their sources. They have to say where the information has come from. Uh, plan and prepare. So they'll give more thought to their notes. What else do they need? They need to expand on this, find other information, maybe from other sources, or present it in a different way, visually. Practice their presentation, rehearse it with somebody, get feedback. Uh, and then we would we would be encouraging them then to make their presentations or to um, put a post on the blog or whatever's appropriate for them to share that. But ultimately, we need to be encouraging them and giving them the confidence to be able to speak publicly, to be able to speak um, coherently and cohesively based on their findings. And obviously, the models for those are some of the lectures that they inevitably will have been listening to. Okay. So strategies for speaking, things that can help our students to develop their speaking skills. Obviously, communication activities, but all kinds of communication activities, whether it's role play, whether it's debating, whether it's discussing, brainstorming, personal recounting of events that have happened to them, speculating about things in the future. Anything and everything. And if students are reluctant speakers, the more opportunities they get, at least initially, to talk about themselves and their own experiences, the better, because they have some personal investment, they can be more engaged with the subject matter, and they're more, they probably feel more encouraged to share it, a little bit more confidence because they know what they're talking about. Any kind of problem solving activity is a great opportunity for speaking, as long as you can get the students to talk through the process. Talking through any process is good for students because they're verbalizing the cognitive processes. And it kind of helps on two levels. It helps them to understand what's going on cognitively. And it also helps them to speak. It helps them to become more confident in that actual verbalization process. So that's a good thing. As we said, role plays can be great, they can be fun, they can be non-threatening. Um, so any sort of stimulation or role play activity doesn't have to be done in front of the class. It can be done in pairs, scattered around quite quietly with everybody getting on with it, just to develop those speaking skills. Developing personal responses in discussions, in questions and answers. <clears throat> Again, where the students are saying things that are relevant to them, or where it's clear that their opinions matter, are being listened to and are valued, those are all good opportunities to develop speaking in a less threatening way for our students. We need to give them, like we've said, the knowledge of those conversation patterns, what's appropriate, what isn't, in terms of turn-taking, uh, language, function, and so forth, and materials to enhance academic speaking skills. At some stage, they do need to listen to more academic spoken English or spoken academic English. <clears throat> so more listening to more formal lectures on the radio or wherever to give them the opportunity for exposure to that so that they become a little bit more confident in deciphering some of that language and some of that approach, that kind of slightly clunky approach that they're less used to. So things that we can do to help them, obviously model good speaking uh, in the same way as we model listening. With listening, we're talking more about the processes that are going on. <clears throat> but with speaking, we can actually have those dialogues or those discussions or those debates with our students so that they hear how we've approached that particular speaking challenge, that, that particular context or a particular function of speaking, uh, and we serve as a model for them. Encouraging reflection, always, always. Um, supporting their reflection as well, in terms of 
explain to them the things they did well, the things that maybe need a little bit more work, but always encourage them to reflect on the processes, on their performance, and to say what they found difficult, because it's not a problem, it's just that's an aid that helps us as teachers to know what we need to focus on. Pair and share activities, we saw those mentioned in, in Elevate in the general English book, but any pair work involving um, speaking, whether it's role play, sharing personal details or whatever, with just two students is a good opportunity for a fairly safe speaking uh, situation where students can maybe experiment a little bit with language or gain confidence. Um, let the students suggest topics for discussion and debate for a change. It doesn't always have to be us or the course book that says, well, we're going to talk about this or what do you think? What are your views on this? Let them lead the lesson. Let them say what they'd like to talk about. Because again, it's going to increase their motivation. It's going to increase their engagement. And it's still speaking. It's still a vehicle for giving them the language, the vocabulary, um, the, the, the functionality and so forth that they need to develop their speaking skills. <clears throat> so there's no reason at all why they can't sometimes choose the topic. Or, as in the next point, lead the lesson. Let them take a lesson for, let, take part of the lesson. I'm sorry, explain it to their um, fellow students. Uh, why not? Because again, they're in a speaking scenario. All of these things will incrementally help to give them more confidence. And teach your students these steps for listening, or rather at least make them explicit and give them the opportunity to develop them. Listen, to imitate, to reflect, to prepare when they're going to speak, to speak and to practice. All those elements are strategies for developing good speaking skills. They'll all help our students to become more confident speakers. So very briefly, just to sum up some of the key things that I said, um, overall an awareness of our students is what we need in terms of their learning styles, the challenges they're facing, the expectations upon them and how we can feed into that. A large part of skills development is building confidence and also explaining the purpose and the function of the different skills we're trying to help our students develop. In terms of motivation, for them, anything with personal relevance is going to be more motivating. Obviously, we have to equip our students with the language that they need to understand listening and to create, to produce the language themselves when they need to speak. And the depth of engagement that they have with either listening or speaking is fundamentally, it's crucial. It's going to determine how successful they are, ultimately <laughs> developing that skill. Okay, that's all I've got to say. Um, I believe a copy of this recording will be made available to you. So those are my details, should you want to contact me. And um, Mohammed, I don't know if you picked up any questions at all while I was talking. I don't, I'm oblivious to the chat box when I'm speaking, so please let me know if you did. Hi, Rachel. Thank you so much. You know, that was Pleasure. very informative as always. Thank you. Um, no, I mean, so far for questions, we haven't had any questions in the Q&A box, uh, but I think now is the time. Uh, so everyone, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to raise a hand to ask your question in the Q&A box or in the chat box. Even. Mm -hmm. yeah. All questions can come after in an email if there's nothing now, I never mind. Yep, it's also uh, true. I can also, um, I mean, I hope you have you already have my email address, but uh, I'm just going to share my email address again in the chat box just in case. Mm -hmm. So here we go. In, any questions? Thank you, Thank you Rachel. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so please feel free to email, email us the questions. Um, thank you so much, Rachel, for that practical session. Pleasure. I'm sure there's a lot to, to I think, to, uh, to try and to add to your own teaching repertoire. Um, yep, thank you, Ruth. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, hopefully we'll be able to deliver another session also in the very near future.
yeah. we will you know so stay kind of uh, tuned we will let, we'll update you as soon as we confirm a date thank <laughs> you and uh yeah uh, thank you so much always thank lovely you. to have you with us rachel thank and you it's my thank pleasure you so thank you so much thank you very much thank you everyone for making the time to join us this uh, afternoon slash evening in saudi uh, we look forward to to hearing from you uh, quite soon about your questions or any other uh, requests and uh, take care until then okay thanks mohammed bye bye everybody thank you bye 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 bye